Hey guys, Eric Johnson here. Day 37, no rocking back and forth. Alcohol free for almost 13 years, I believe, and uh, no other substances except for, you know, caffeine, but working on changing that too. But, you know, I was walking out here to do a video. We're in Texas now, and I wanted to talk about, you know, I just want to get really deep with you guys on my journey and maybe help you with your journey maybe we can connect but I was walking out here and it was so beautiful it instantly reminded me of my drinking days I would walk to the park with a couple friends we'd have a six-pack or whatever 12-pack and the funny thing is is when I take you know when I would drink a beer or two it would somehow open up my nasal passageways and I could really smell smell the sweetness of the summer air and it just gave me a sense of childhood it gave me a sense of happiness and nostalgia but by the end of the evening of drinking all day in the Sun it turned into a nightmare and then it was dark and then it was a cold room and then I would piss myself or black out or pass out or whatever but it was always a lie and for so many years I would always tell myself you know tonight's gonna be the night it's gonna be awesome you're gonna drink and everything's going to turn out right and it just never did you know there was a couple hours here and there that there was a lot of bliss but a couple hours of bliss never justifies years of hell and so let me start a little little bit back further when I was growing up in California my dad and I were walking um, in a boat haven or we were on the we were on the water and we were walking a long pier and a drunk guy walked by and he was pointing to his arm and he was talking really weird and yelling <clears throat> and uh, you know he was he could have been mentally ill but I was really terrified of him I was only like five years old and I still remember it to this day I'm 48 years old and uh, I looked at my dad and I was like what's wrong with him my dad's like oh he's drunk and so I was like I didn't even know what that meant and so later when I was introduced to alcohol my parents sheltered me quite a bit even you know watching television with my mom and my dad sometimes my mom would cover my eyes if there was a you know a scene on TV and this is back in the 80s you know there wasn't anything really rated R back then on public television but my mom would cover my eyes they didn't cuss they didn't drink and so but I was fascinated with alcohol I was fascinated with drugs I was fascinated later on with the dark side and I was fascinated with mental illness and schizophrenia um, I just I thought their artwork was completely phenomenal and I wanted to understand mental illness or schizophrenia and when I was in my 20s, I romanticized it. I wanted to be insane at one point. I told a friend that when we were driving somewhere because I was, an, I was a budding artist and I wanted my art to be so abnormal that people would revere me as, you know, as an artistic genius because at that point I thought tragic artists were the best. The ones with the mental illnesses, the ones that used heroin the ones that were bisexual the ones that were tattooed up or whatever I, I really was drawn to abnormal everything so back to the alcohol when a friend introduced me to a bottle of beer when I was almost 17 I was very scared about that bottle because I had no idea what one bottle of alcohol would do I thought it would get me drunk and I pretended to drink all of it but I poured half of it out around the corner 
in the other room in our basement and so that you know I didn't get a buzz or anything so it didn't hook me the next time I drank I had a four pack of coolers at a dance a high school dance we drank the wine coolers out in the field and it it lit me up that was the very first time that I felt the alcohol in my bloodstream and it gave me this manic euphoria and I knew at that moment that I found my magic potion so I went back into that dance I danced with a girl even though friends were teasing me on the sidelines because I was teased a lot my dad teased me my friends teased me even the teachers teased me it seemed like everyone was against me and alcohol was my very first lover in fact I got a buzz before I even kissed a girl for the most part that I remember you know um, could never get a girlfriend I was quiet I was considered weird I just wanted to listen to music and rock back and forth that's why I flunked out of high school because I rocked back and forth from after dinner until bedtime listening to Judas Priest Iron Maiden Ozzy Osbourne um, and daydreaming about or fantasizing about getting the bullies back in school uh, I was I was just a lone wolf I just played by myself I, I had good friends but we'd always play one-on-one -on -one. if groups came around I would I would leave I couldn't hang out in groups so alcohol was my first lover besides music and it took me on a wild journey and I think the journey has to be uh, I'd like to talk about this journey because I don't want to romanticize it but I, I want to just talk about how invincible and immortal I felt it really was a terrific ride and just like Steve Jobs at one point said that he really enjoyed taking LSD that it was one of the most beautiful times in his life which a lot of would shock a lot of people today but there were some great times on alcohol but it was very early and it only lasted a couple hours and then you had to pay dearly for it and later on in life it almost killed me I had a heart attack when I was 32 lost 80 jobs lost eight girlfriends uh, various jail time and so it turned against me and it will turn against you too if you rely on it if you look forward to it if you're relying on it and looking forward to that buzz just be prepared that you're gonna want to increase that buzz if you if you're an addict like I am I still call myself an addict because I get addicted to anything if you're looking forward to that buzz I'll tell you right now I can save you your life and decades of misery and tell you right now it's a freaking lie alcohol never gave me long-term happiness ever in fact it depleted my feel-good hormones depleted my dopamine my serotonin and uh, made me anxious around people more than ever so it did the opposite of what I wanted it to do but I had fun because I could laugh I could talk freely I didn't feel like I had a you know weight on my shoulders so the funny thing is is that even though I was so scared of alcohol in the very beginning I loved it embraced it with my whole life obsessed about it laser focused on it until it almost killed me um, when I was 32 so from 20 to 32 and then I had a heart attack so only 12 years of serious drinking that's how hard I drank it got to the point when I was 34 to 36 I stopped eating because it was ruining my buzz or I didn't have money for food and uh, I switched to malt liquor well I drank malt liquor throughout but I could only afford malt liquor towards the end and it was this nasty stuff with 10% uh, alcohol and uh, malt liquor and it just made me mad it did weird stuff it was like I mean I'm not gonna blame the alcohol I was doing bad stuff anyways but 
the point is, is that I couldn't even hold down yogurt towards the end of it. I couldn't hold a job. My bed smelled so bad of urine. I couldn't make it to the bathroom every night. I was so blacked out, passed out. And it really got ugly. I remember going to church one time with my mom, Christmas Eve. And I just had so much guilt and shame from my alcoholic life. I carried that guilt and shame around along with all the other addictions that caused guilt and shame. It was a never ending cycle. I would get drunk, the next day I would feel guilt and shame. Then I would fap, smoke cigarettes, do other things that made me feel guilty and shame as well. Plus on top of that I had Asperger's so eye contact with people was basically you know nil because I had such low self-esteem. So the other thing is is that another addiction uh, music I, um, I was scared of music when I was six years old or five I was watching a parade I was in preschool or kindergarten something like that and a parade came to our school and when the drum section walked by I started crying because the loud snare drum noise scared the heck out of me I cried in front of a girl that I liked and she was so concerned about me and I was so embarrassed because she was attending me while I was crying I just got out of there, had to go to the nurse's office, but six years later, I got a drum set. So it's just kind of ironic that the things I feared the most, I embraced the most, but not, not the good stuff. I mean, I've wanted to be a millionaire or very successful in my life. Never got that, but I got all the bad things. And here's the thing, when you're really deep, dark, when you're really deep into your addictions, you kind of romanticize it and you think that you're doing really good things. You think that you're cool. You think that your rebellion is somehow uh, worthy of merit. You know, there was a time when I, I was destructive. I was burning bridges with friends left and right. I was walking out of jobs and somehow I thought that was wonderful. That's how distorted my thinking was. I thought it was cool to uh, get tattoos and and cheat and lie and steal because I was being lied to by the you know Satan basically the dark forces they love that stuff So your choice is you know, do you want to feed the dark side or the light side? I tell you what if you feed the dark side you're going to get a hundred times more of a backlash negative backlash it will just it will destroy you if you want to be the baddest person in the room you will be destroyed by this life i'll tell you that right now the only way to survive this life and actually have joy happiness and build self-esteem is to do the right thing be sober be healthy you know don't eat crap don't drink anything that's poisonous simple rules like that you know if you look around at nature nature is very simple there's not a lot of bells and whistles with nature sure there's fires and tornadoes hurricanes but mother nature always repairs itself and it's just here for us every single day it doesn't waver so if you want a phenomenal life don't waver and don't look for the next best thing or the get rich quick scheme or fad diets or uh, new substances or whatever, okay? So, right now, every single day, I am learning who I am. I'm a slow learner when it comes to good things. I'm a quick learner. Uh, I'm a quick learner, I'm a quick learner and doing the wrong things. When it comes to doing the right things, I'm very slow, if that makes sense. I probably screwed that up. I've never been good at saying little clicky things, but I miss you guys.
I miss connecting with people. Um, I'm here in Texas with my fiance. She's the one who told me I could have Asperger's about a year and a half, two years ago. So I have a late diagnosis. I did an autism test and I, I scored on the lower spectrum, but I scored on the spectrum nonetheless. And it just all came together. My whole life came together within a 15 minute test. And I'm so thankful that Misha told me about Asperger's. It all started because she was like, yeah, you know, I was talking about trains one day and she's like, oh, you know, Asperger's people like trains. And so I looked into it. But what a lot of people don't talk about, I can't find a lot about it, is Asperger's and addictions. And a lot of people that have Asperger's just feel so awkward in social situations that they start self-medicating. And that's what I've been doing since I was eight, when I started rocking. I can tell you all the addictions, you know, chronologically, you know, it was, I was eight when I started rocking back and forth. That was the first stimming. Um, then it was rock music when I was 12. Then it was cigarettes and coffee when I was 16. Then it was alcohol when I was 17. And, uh, you know, porn later on. Just on and on and on, all these addictions. And like I said, when you're thinking through your addictions and you're distorted in your reality, you think addictions are cool. Um, I remember watching a video, uh, Jane's Addiction. I was watching Jane's Addiction, it was a music video. And I saw the bass player and the guitar player, I think they, they kissed two guys and since I was playing with myself as a little boy I was like why not start you know indulging in bisexuality because that's what the cool artists do that's what the cool musicians do and it never felt natural but I had this obsession with myself I'm not gonna get into details but Freud would have a heyday with my story and you could say that I basically got tripped up on the potty training stage and liked to do things to myself. And uh, so I was like, why not just pursue that and just go all out? Because the cool artists are the ones who are bisexual, they do heroin, they do coke, they, they're drunks like Charles Bukowski. He's a, he's a drunk, he made it look cool. But you gotta stay out of that trap. It's gonna look really cool from the outside. It's gonna look really cool from the outside. But to sin is to die. To sin is death, all right? That's the bottom line. Said that in the Bible 2,000 years ago. And it's never changed ever since. In fact, there are still demons today People are like, oh yeah, you believe in demons. Yeah, right, you must be one of those conspiracy theorists or, <clears throat> you know, you believe in the supernatural. It's, it's true, guys, it's totally true. I've, I've, uh, I've gotten completely sober from the Holy Spirit. One time, <clears throat> my uh, fiance and I, we were doing uh, some plant medicine and it was becoming a bad trip and I prayed to Jesus to stop it. And lo and behold, two minutes later, I was dead sober. I was completely sober and uh, started crying with joy because I knew it wasn't anything else but the Holy Spirit. In fact, I say this in other videos, the Holy Spirit is the cleanest high you'll ever experience. It lasts the longest, it fills your heart, because most addicts feel like their heart is empty and they can't fill it. They can't fill it with their addictions. They can't fill it with sex, drugs, rock and roll. The only thing that fills it is the ultimate love by, guess you, our father. And demons are still real. I've smelled angels, okay? There was one time I did a hypnosis 
and you call in your archangels. And I was laying on the floor. During the hypnosis, I smelled a cologne I have never smelled in my life. It was a very rich, wealthy, but very, very old cologne. And I do believe it was an angel coming in. Because when you call angels in, they come. If you're sincere, if you're really asking. I know I'm on a tangent, guys, but this is my life. And maybe you can connect with something on this. And leave a comment. Because life is a trip. Reality is crazier than, and, than fiction. You know that. You see it right now on the news. Everything is so upside down. It's insane. And if you're watching this, I am so glad that you're still hanging in there. That you're, you're alive. Because the overdose rate right now, the suicide rate, is through the roof. And they won't mention it. Seems like a plan, doesn't it? So, the things I was scared about, I embraced. But they were the wrong things. Like the music, the alcohol, the drugs, the bisexuality, whatever. It was all a lie. I got nothing out of it. It robbed me. And I've had to spend the last 13 years rebuilding. Almost died with a heart attack. So don't really romanticize those old days. They're gone. That's, that's another addiction. Looking at the past and getting nostalgic. Going down memory, memory lane. There's been many nights, many days, that I just listened to music. I'd put on some old music and I would go down memory lane. And guess what? It gave me dopamine. It gave me a hit of nostalgia, which is another addiction. All of it comes down to the little dopamine hits. Even checking your email, getting a voicemail, getting an email. I got, I was in the home business industry for six years. I used to get 20 to 50 leads a day. And I got addicted to seeing that little number by, by my inbox. I had to open it up and I got addicted to emails. Now, I deleted Facebook, deleted Twitter, and uh, don't get those emails anymore. Things are, you know, things are getting a little tough. That's why I'm doing these videos. So, long story short I feel more vulnerable I feel like I'm coming out clean don't even know who I am some days but you know guys we all have a big heart that's why we ran with addictions because we didn't feel understood we didn't feel heard my dad used to just laugh at me now he says he's proud of me and I need to learn how to accept that because he means it now. He says, I'm proud of you. Every time I talk to him on the phone, he says, I'm proud of you. Do I accept it? Not 100%. Because I still don't like myself. I still have guilt and shame from alcohol 13 years ago. It's very demoralizing, guys. Plus PTSD. Going into work hungover, shaking with withdrawals, fearing that people would catch me drinking alcohol in my car on lunch breaks. It got to the point when I wasn't eating and drinking, I had to uh, speak to my coworkers in one sentence or less. Because if I spoke more, they would hear my trembling. So I would say things really fast, like, could you hand me that knife, please? Thank you. But if it went past that, I would start to shake like this because I was dying from malnutrition. I wasn't eating anymore. I was drinking malt liquor. That was it. So I was very scared, especially the nights I couldn't sleep and I had a beer by my side might as well have hooked it up to my arm like an IV. 
If I couldn't sleep, I would just take five gulps. And then I'd be shaking. I would just, it was like a vibration. The withdrawals is like a buzz, I mean a vibration, and it doesn't stop, and you can't sleep because you, you're like a rubber band vibrating. That's not fun, guys, and it's not romantic. That's all I got today. Love you guys. Hit that subscribe button. We'll carry this on further.